And we should be live. Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to another S uh, episode of the STX Next live show. And if I'm counting correctly, this is our fifth one. Nice round number and a very nice session ahead of us today. Joining us today are not one guest, but two guests this time around. Daniel Koszczynski and Paul Yordeczka. Guys, how are you feeling today? I'm feeling great. Thanks for having me. It's great. Hi, folks. <laughs> it's great to it's great to have you too okay i see the first people are trickling in the first part as always is you know the technical checks so do leave us a comment if you can hear us if you can see us and if everything is working correctly it would be best to solve these issues now than to have them you know affect the whole uh, stream that we have prepared for you today so the topic for today is product analytics or just well the provocative title i suppose is don't screw up your product analytics <laughs> so we're going to help you to do that and the first thing i wanted to ask you guys is who do you hope is tuning in today and who's going to benefit the most from what we have to present yeah so i'm looking at product managers today especially and mvp pre-mvp startup founders uh, i think they can get the most out of this talk. We'll talk about metrics, tracking success, and growing the product. So I think that's that's a topic for them. And I'm leaning towards um, CEOs. Um, as a former like product manager and VP of product, it's just like, Daniel, you're stealing my, my target audience. <laughs> but, but I believe I'm working recently more with the C-level and you know adopting the data-driven approach. So I believe, um, hopefully well, like there will be some lessons learned and experience uh, worth uh, sharing for them today yeah all right awesome okay so let's say you're talking to one of them you're talking to a product manager you're talking to a ceo or talking to a founder and obviously since we're talking about product analytics we think it's pretty important to focus on that what would you say to a product manager or a ceo or a founder that would make them move product analytics to the top of their priority list Right. So I think that product analytics um, gives you this a better understanding of what is happening inside your product and allows you to uh, take better decisions, right? Um, you will get lots of data from the web, but you will not necessarily get the same um, insights from the product. So there are different tools for the job. We'll talk about them today. Yes, and I, I always like to think about it like, you know, it's all about uh, making informative decisions and uh, every CEO wants that for his team. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and as a first product maker, he, he he's doing them first, right? And, and, you know, the funny thing is that we all want it, right? But then the numbers showing different things. So if you look at different service, uh, surveys like uh, Thunder Act, for instance, they're saying that 53% of product managers, they, like, you know, they don't have the data to make the best possible decisions. And part of mm. it is data analytics. So I think, um, you know, just willing to go that path and just having everything what we need is, you know, there's a huge gap. So it's just like, I would agree somehow with Daniel that it's about making informative decisions or best possible decisions, right? To have some sort of um, just knowledge or like to have the prioritization mechanism like a North Star that helps us to grow our business. Yeah, you mentioned the North Star. I know that that's a discussion that we're going to have for later, right? Sure. Uh, we did some prep for this. I know that like, you guys disagree on some points, so I'm looking forward to that. Meanwhile, we've got a comment coming in from Damian Vinchevsky on LinkedIn. Ben and Sergey, maybe this is valuable content for you. Well, I hope Ben and Sergey will be joining us very, very soon. And I can see the number of viewers going up slowly. So <laughs> if you're Ben or Sergey, hi. If you're anybody else, hi to you as well. All right. So uh, now that we know, you know why it should be a priority and why product analytics should be important for product managers. What you said, as I understand it, is that if I'm a product manager, more likely than not, I don't have the data I need to make informed decisions, right? So that's you know even more important. So let's kind of lay down the, the landscape. What are the typical problems with product analytics? Well, there's a, there's a huge problem with analytics in general. So, so let, 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 let's take a step back here, right? All right. If we look like at the entire analytics landscape, 
uh, and we dig a little bit in the research, it turns out that in the United States alone, like 3.1 trillion US dollars are simply lost because of poor data quality. So it's trillion, data, right? Trillion, yeah. So okay. data quality, for sure, one of the issues, right? Mm -hmm. um, and even looking at the marketing field more so, so my field, right? Um, there's been a very interesting uh, video published by LinkedIn B2B Institute, uh, and, and they examined the quality and accuracy of data in the ad platforms. So mm -hmm. third-party data, things like demographics, things like interests of the mm -hmm. audience and stuff like that. And it turns out that 40 to 50% of, of the data was actually accurate. The rest is simply garbage, right? So, so you would be better off by flipping a coin that targeting people via these platforms. And th this, this, so this is ridiculous. And this translates to product analytics because the issues are pretty similar. I don't know, what's your take, Pablo? Uh, I hope to create creative, uh, like just to disagree somehow today with you and just like to have like more um, just spice here in this discussion. But uh, I mean, I, I would say, yeah, I mean, th this is good good data. We you, you brought it to me before, like even the conversation and uh, it is quite astonishing. But I think, you know, the, 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 the bigger challenge is just actually to capture the data. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then also like to look, how do you organize people around the data so that you can actually make use of it, right? So what I'm seeing, and we maybe we'll get to it, is just like even you know when I started working with U.S. clients from Silicon Valley, that it's just always it was a like a dream or like or a plan somewhere over there, right? It turned out to be that there are actually, of course, it's a I'm now you know generalizing, right? But just most of them were just starting with data driven development so we are here mm. in europe or like i had better better like mo like way better examples especially the startup scene so um it's just um so the challenge is just to capture them correctly have and, and be understand like what are the risks and just what are the typical mistakes and hopefully we'll share some of them today right yeah, I was wondering about that because before we started, you know, recording, uh, we had this one prep session where I, I believe it was you, Daniel, but correct me if I'm wrong here. You laid out these kind of three typical scenarios with product analytics, each of them problematic in a different way. So I was wondering if you could talk about that. So these are three different cases that I come across most often, right? Mm -hmm. And one would be a company that doesn't have analytics infrastructure yet. So it most likely a startup. And they know that they need to track things. They need to get some data from their product, but they don't know what to track, right? Mm -hmm. So so the first case, I want to track, but I don't know what. The second case would be, um, I have some infrastructure, right? And I track everything, every single data point. Everything okay. is important to me, right? So I um, catch them all, right? I've got it all. But I have I don't have time to analyze that because there's too much data. Mm. And I don't have a team or resources uh, to properly analyze that, right? It happens very often, especially in mid-sized uh, companies. And then we have the third approach, which I also, you know, I experienced that myself several times. So I thought that everything is fine, right? So I have tracking in place. I think I have everything implemented. I, I collect data, but I'm not entirely sure that the tracking is correct. So I don't mm -hmm. trust my data, right? I look at uh, Google Analytics, for example, and I see this report and I try to recreate the same report in a different tool and it says they shows me different numbers right right yeah. uh so this happens very often as well it, that's usually boils down to issues with implementation uh very common one so yeah the three types of cases here so either i'm tracking nothing i'm tracking everything or i'm tracking some things but i don't trust what i see because i see yeah. discrepancies between tools for example exactly yes Right. Yeah, but I would argue that is, the, I mean, the first scenario is like a good problem to have. Like, it, I mean, <laughs> you're lucky or like you made good decisions if you are there. Like this, this would be my take on that. Yeah, it's it's technically it should be easier to tweak, 
right? But the issue with that is usually you don't you can't get the data, you know, from the past, right? So you can't get the data points that you, let's say you decided not to track something, and now you want to track that data, so you can't get them from the past, pretty much, right? So mm -hmm. you don't have historical data on, on several things. Okay, so that's a few scenarios of how product analytics can maybe not exactly go wrong, uh, but it can be not such a useful tool uh, in the product managers, CEOs, or founders' hands. So now let's start delivering on that promise that we made when we were well <laughs> when we were promoting this live stream. Actually, one of the questions that we want to answer here today then is what metrics to track. So you know, whichever one of you. If you could start, you know, <laughs> sharing a little bit of your experience about what metrics to, to track. I'll jump here then, Daniel. <laughs> so, start. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I want to start. Like, I've made lots of mistakes on my way, and I, I think it's a good way to start. So one of them mm -hmm. is just like was many, many, many years ago. But I think you know, whenever we start our own endeavor, this this is a you know quite popular scenario, right? So you, I've jumped straight to Google Analytics. As because we'll get to get Google Analytics anyway, but just you know installation is really easy, and what what result you know the result was that I was just like looking at page views and <laughs> active sessions, and there is a like I think a really good saying uh, here in in you know the data domain that you know like the actions I mean here user actions are speak louder than page views, right? So oh. it's more important what's what's going on in the product itself than looking at those vanity metrics, some sort of, right? So um, what kind of user actions do you meet here? Yeah, so I'll, I'll just like move it around. So it, this is the mistake, right? But so like the, the, the good way to go would be just to think of um, business questions that you have first. Mm -hmm. It's just like when I like had a, ch a chance to meet designers like uh, and you know, the, 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 let's say the dinosaurs are saying, you start to design the logo on the piece of paper, then you, you go to the computer like later mm -hmm. on, right? But you mm -hmm. should have the picture like of what you want to have, and the same is here. Like so, I argue that it's better to start with the piece of so-called piece of paper, right? Or like the old-fashioned way, and with the business questions instead, like then going to the tool, right? And easy to say, but there are tools that can help you out, right? And um, you know, like I, I know Daniel is in love with many frameworks, right? Like we all are, right? So Canvas frameworks, etc., right? They ha all help us out, and but just so if I, sh sh you know, just uh, should drop some names, I would just go at you know there are different ones. Like Heart framework is more like UX uh, focusing, fo like focusing more on UX from Google. There's like Pirate Funnel by Dave McClure, right? So I think the most famous one just it created was created ten years ago. So uh, this is A A R R R, right? So R. Uh, okay. <laughs> also, there's like there are like you know uh, Pirate Reverse Pirate Funnel, right? So don't get lost right here. But it's just uh, I think you know it, it's good to understand that. Funnels help us to focus, and especially if we are CEOs or entrepreneurs or like product managers, like maybe not so organized people like Daniel, right? Uh, <laughs> or uh, somewhere at the beginning of our journey, right? That we 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 want to have it all right, sales, marketing, etc. Um, I think it's important to have the structure, right? And okay. uh, that's why I believe in funnels, like because they help us to structure our company, our um, our business into some mm -hmm. sort of stages, right? And you know mm -hmm. it's. Always, uh, it is said that, you know, like always start with the funnel and this would be my principle here, right? My tip, right? I didn't do so, it first. So I think, I believe it's worth saying that I'm not, um, I mean, the blame is, the blame was also on me here. Yeah. Okay. So what I'm hearing is like the first part of the answer is don't get too lost in Google Analytics or any sort of tool to begin with, but start with a piece of paper or like a Google Doc and just think, about the funnel and the path that your users need to take, what actions they need to take along the way to converting, whatever conversion means for you. True. And um, I, would, I would just say that, you know, like maybe Daniel can add some, some, something here later on, but just like you always, it's, it's tempting to go and to be dogmatic about the funnel and the structure. So you have uh -huh. the acquisition, activation, retention, referral, revenue. 
or even you can add awareness at the top and some of the frameworks name it differently, like engagement uh, rather than activation. It mm -hmm. doesn't matter. Like, I mean, it matters, but it's not the most important thing. It's, it's just like, if I'll give an example here, like let's say we're building another uh, Netflix, right? So uh, just if this is like step one for you, you know, the activation will be okay. So number of signups versus signups, like just so comparing different time periods, for instance, right? Then I know it's like really basic. So please like uh, forgive me, like for those who are, you know, it's super obvious, right? I'll, I'll just- For those of us watching at Netflix, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> we don't yeah, exactly so, see your analytics. <laughs> so then is activation, right? So whether, you know, the user or you, like what portion of users just like uh, watched like at least one video, right? For instance, mm -hmm. somewhere over there is like retention or so like how, how frequently they're coming back but referral but revenue of course is about upgrading to, to the paid plan right mm -hmm. and it sounds simple but if you go to google analytics and or like you you start with you know you'll go into mix panel and then it will be paralyzed by data i think it's really really easy to get lost here mm -hmm. so it's important Daniel, to measure you're... like the big actions there yeah how you would how you would you would start with tracking that? yeah it's like with um with marketing and everything literally you, you, to develop a strategy, you need to have a thinking time. You need to think, right? What do you want to track, right? And strategy is more so about what not to track. So starting with writing down business questions, I think it's a perfect uh, way to begin implementation of, of analytics infrastructure in general uh, mm -hmm. for, for product, right? So write down business questions in terms of what framework you will use. I like frameworks, as you said, Pablo, I like frameworks yeah. because it, for me, like in my opinion, they make this whole thing simpler, more mm -hmm. organized as, as, as you said, right? And if you examine each framework, they're really not that different from each other. They're at the heart of them, they're very similar. It boils down to, look, I can attract one thing, North Star, right? It's not that simple. It's it's a slight oversimplification to track just one metric to rule them all, uh, because businesses are more you know sophisticated. So you start with um with with a constellation of metrics that is often referred to, right? Uh -huh. So you start with one thing. You you pick important metric that usually called an output metric. So it simply says whether you're doing good or bad, right? It's not actionable. It could be, for example, revenue or mm -hmm. active users, daily active users, weekly active users, right? And it will tell you whether your product is progressing or regressing, right? Mm -hmm. it, it can translate well into the monetary value, right? So profit or revenue. Um, but these are output metrics. You cannot do that much stuff with them. They are not actionable. And then in order, if you were given a task, hey, you want to make this metric better, higher number, right? For example, Spotify, right? Mm -hmm. What could be an output metric? Something that gives value to the user, let's say, okay? So I bet uh, value to the user at Spotify would be when I listen to a song, right? So time spent listening could be that output metric. Then when I, I were given a task, okay, Daniel, make this metric better, make people listen more. And I need to drill down. What can I do? Okay, let's select some input metrics, kind of like KPIs, like indicators. Mm. Am, I, am I doing good or bad? You, you won't be able to tell that, you know, from the beginning, is that the right input metric? So is it the right KPI? But for example, I could hypothesize, hypothesize that time spent listening, okay, what could influence that? Um, bringing users more often, for example, right? Or increasing the session duration so people can consume more audio content on, mm. on, on the platform. And you can drill it down even further. Okay, so how I can bring users more often? Maybe include some notifications or song recommendations, right? So they, you know, get the recommendation via email or push notification and they will get back to the app and check the song. 
the same for session duration. You can uh, break that down further to, for example, like Spotify does, discovery albums, right? They release a discovery album. So when you browse and you're looking for, for songs, suddenly, suddenly you see, hey, here's a new new song, album for you. Check it out. That, will, mm. that could increase the session duration. And you will have to rotate that. There's going to be a turnover in this input metrics. Um, but finally, you will see the correlation at mm -hmm. some point between the input and output because the input metric should lead to an output metric. Okay. So there's like, there's one thing, one metric that you really care about going up, in this case, time spent listening. Uh, yeah. But that doesn't help you because you have to look at the kind of the levers that you can pull to try to increase that ultimate metric. In terms of Spotify, it reminds me of this feature that they have that even if you're listening to a predefined playlist, for example, they once the playlist is over, it doesn't stop, but it still continues to recommend songs based on that. And you know, even if it takes you, you know, a song or two to actually realize, hey, this isn't the album I was listening to, there's still it's still a little bit more time spent listening. So you know, in that case, the, the metric uh, is is helpful to actually come up with actionable ideas. That's at least how I'm understanding this. Before Pablo, you, I know you want to respond. I just wanted to say somebody said hi on the chat. On LinkedIn. Hi Adam. Hi Adam. Hi, Adam. We see you. We appreciate good, you. Good to see you. Yeah. Adam Sharozanovich, if anybody's listening or watching from outside of Poland, try pronouncing that. <laughs> and now back to metrics and what Pavel wanted to say here. I, I just want to say that, you know, it's easy to say about, you know, um, uh, Airbnb or Spotify sure. or et cetera. I will throw here an example from, from my own experience and, and, you know, hopefully, you know, it will be more spice here in this, in this pot. So, um, I'm uh, aligned with Daniel here. So just I said that, you know, step one is just business questions, right? And we are on the same page here. And the good way to go is just to take the framework to do it, right? But this is start of, is the beginning of the journey. So when you have the funnel, uh, I, I was once like a product manager in a startup. We were, like, ag we were aggregating um, company information uh, and, and just from different sources. So you can think of companies house, so company registry data, and they like the data from credit bureaus, et cetera, right? Just helping companies with the key OAC process or uh, AML, so anti-money laundering, right? And the issue was that that it's it's always easy to look on signups, right? And then, uh, so like the first the first like you know top of the funnel, but we've uh, putting the funnel and the and the numbers we've realized, and it was it's just like um, it was data backing up our intuition that actually people are not coming back, right? So retention. And this is what I want to say that you know you look on the funnel and it's easy for everyone to see, hey. You know, this is like we, we're losing 50% of, of, of traffic here, right? And then you have to zoom in, you have to deep dive. And uh, that's why I believe in those panels, just better than, you know, in tools, even just when you go meet your CEO or like you prepare a report. I always like to be one slide guy, right? Just to be highly visual and, and just like, you know, tell the story around it. So we, we'll get to product culture and building, you know, like, the, 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 you know, creating the change in the organization. So most probably we'll get back to how to communicate like the data is important, right? But uh, what I want to say that we've realized that people were not coming back and then you, you usually you have to take uh, another tools, right? So we did, of course, here are, we will get to tools anyway, but just we, we used uh, um, session tracking tools, right? Just to see, okay, what, what the hell is going on, right? There were issues with search, like we, people just were lost. We changed the filters and the whole experience, right? It didn't work, right? So then we do we did like a, a, a IDIs, so qualitative, uh, quantitative research. And then it was like pretty, you know, after five interviews, like it was, it, it was easy to understand that this target group is not having there is no stickiness in the product, right? So they won't be coming back, you know, regularly because it's just a one-time event, right? Once per quarter, maybe once per half a year. So it's always good when you discover such such things, right? It's always good to have, for instance, just to give a tip here, to create a funnel for a selected target group, right? Segment, and then try to figure out more, like, you know, what's going on there. So as Daniel said, it's just uh, you have to, 
you know, like have some hypothesis and answer or like throw other questions just to, uh, just to understand more, right? And be able to improve. Sometimes it's not about like UX or UI, it's just about like the whole product, which is more painful, obviously, for product managers. Yeah, I, I like the funnel idea, right? The idea is good, but what I don't like about the funnel, it, it tries to make everything linear. Well, it, it's not linear, right? Mm -hmm. People can, you know, jump through the steps in the funnel and, you know, suddenly just simply churn or whatever. So, like, maybe I'm a little bit, you know, skewed because of my marketing background. We use funnels in marketing and they often don't work. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah. so g g give me an example. I, I'm sorry, it's just a good point to no, argue. No, no, so. we're trying, like, for example, when yeah. you try to build, you start with awareness, right? Mm -hmm. And you try to go into the, this consideration stage and then decision stage, right? And finally, the, 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 the final action, the desired outcome, and then maybe some referrals and stuff like that. So the very basic funnel, right? For product, that would be, um, also, awareness activation, meaning performing the, the most important action. Will you get when you get value, right? Then will be engagement and perhaps retention. Mm -hmm. um, so in marketing, you can go straight from awareness. Awareness is actually the first step that always needs to happen because people need to know you, right? But mm -hmm. from awareness, you can jump right away to the to the very end to the decision. It happens. It, it doesn't need to be linear. So the, the person doesn't need to go through, okay, I know the company. Now I need to think about uh, whether I like them, right? It, it, it's not that linear, right? It, it's, sure, sure. I, you I, can I, jump I, through steps. Yeah. I agree, but in the same time, it's just like uh, it's good to have at least some sort of structure, like to have the you know yes. to have at the, at the very beginning, just to you know lear learn numbers to forget forget numbers, right? Just to start with something. Yeah, so for for product, it it makes more sense, right? Because mm -hmm. having a basic funnel, for example, the one that I mentioned uh, a while ago, it gives you like. Breaks down the product into pieces or the life cycle stages of the user, right? And I mm -hmm. think that coming back to frameworks a little bit, which is one of my favorite topics, right? So <laughs> uh, uh, I think that Mixed Panel does a great job in terms of uh, not only the content that they're producing about product analytics, but uh, they have a really neat framework that it's kind of like marrying the two the North Star idea and the funnel approach. Mm -hmm. So, so what what they do is they have a instead of a north star metric, they have a focus metric. Okay, the, the wording is a little bit different, but essentially, the the focus metric is something that th this one metric that you, you look at it, and if it if it grows, you, you can tell that your business is doing well, right? So, mm -hmm. typical output metric, uh, but it's not the most important thing in the world, right? We're not blindly following this uh, focus metric. It's important, but it's not the most important. And then you have this layer down. Uh, so they call it level one metrics. And they have split them into uh, like life cycle stages, like user journey, right? So here's the reach. So the entire population of, let's say, subscribers, if you're a SaaS, uh, that you have in a given time period. Then you have activation. So people that performed a specific action. So once again, could be Spotify, listen to a song, this crucial mm -hmm. action that gives value to them, right? And then you have engagement. So that adds the um, frequency and intensity of, you know, these actions happening. And then we have retention and a, another category of business specific metrics because, you know, you can you can't have the same set of metrics for every business. They're going to be unique for for each case. And then you can drill down into level two and three, whatever your business requires. But but the basic focus and level one metrics, I think it's a good thing to marry the two North Star and the funnel approach. Okay, it's it's getting complicated, like with those levels. So I, I'm yeah, I would level. say that. You know, I was wondering. Like, because I'm still thinking, you know, about uh, somebody, you know, potentially watching us, and all, all of those people watching watching us right now. And you know, if, let's 
kind of try to summarize all that we said. And if you could, you know, imagine this product managers or founders to do list, what would you put on that to do list to make their product analytics better? Or pro or better that the, the, we are assuming that they already have product analytics. <laughs> well, I suppose that's one scenario, right? But we could yeah. we could cover both. If they don't have it, where to start? Because what I you know what I heard from you is like look up Heart as a framework, look up, look up Pirate Metrics. Very fun articles on that I found. No, don't, right? don't, don't look at too many frameworks. It's it's uh, that's not the idea, right? Okay, so what would you put on the list? I'll chime in just to, just to start, Daniel. Just please, yeah, sure. like, like you know, like say say also from from your end. So, like first thing, uh, just start with the with the business questions, right? To help mm -hmm. you out, you can you can go to um, Dave McClure, like the Pirate Funnel, right, uh, mm -hmm. framework, and just to fill the the most important actions, right, that you need to have, right, you need to track. Then uh, obviously get a tool. We'll get to this part, right? Get get the, get your tools there, and um, just uh, look where you have the biggest issue, where where your biggest challenge is. If this is ret retention or awareness or activation, or whatever, and then drill down right into this field, right? Just uh, mo sometimes get another tool if needed, but just if you if you your your uh, choice was good, right? In terms of tool tooling. It's just like uh, analyzing segments, adding additional layers to your analysis, right? Um, optimize, 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 right? <laughs> and then, and then uh, be happy with your revenue. Uh, but somewhere on the way is just like the maybe I'm going too far. Just stop me if, if that's too much. But just we were we were talking about the, the the need to simplify things and the one metric that rule them all. So there's somewhere on the way is just the, the the need just to have this key focus, right? Just to structure, you know, somehow um, put your team al in alignment to what you, where you want to move your business, and this is extremely important with, on the CEO level, uh, if you're growing, you know, if your team is expanding. So we didn't take, you know, I don't want to, you know, go too fast, but just maybe, uh, you know, like something for for later. We'll see. I know time is limited, so maybe Daniel, like, what's what's your view on that? Whether you will agree with the to-do list overview? I I mean, uh, not with everything, but I, I agree with start with questions, right? And it's not that I don't dis I don't agree with everything or or disagree in general, but I would add different steps in between. Okay. So start with questions. Uh, it, it, they got a business questions, right? So the next step that you need to do is look at your business, right? What brings value to the user and what brings, you know, you profit, right? Mm. Uh, how you monetize your business. Um, and then look at your product once again and try to map flows of the user. So what are the steps to, to the key actions, right? So what, what, what to, and, like you can segment that into flows, right? If you're a product, right, you will need to measure people that register. And because you want to know where the uh, holes and, and, and the funnel, right, in this case, or in the journey. So map the flows, registration flow, sign up, uh, sign in flow, right? Or uh, using a specific feature flow, right? Map those out. And then you will be able to start selecting events that you want to track, right? So that's uh, because you need to start with implementation you need to implement something. So you need to have that data point um, in place. So we need to map all of that. And the, the, the fourth thing that I would suggest uh, to help you out with everything that I said, in point, especially point two and three, is use this framework or at least take a look at it, uh, Mixed Panels Guide to Product Metrics. Uh, I've been using it for quite a while and it's been working really well for me. Don't take it as like a set in stone kind of framework, but you know, it will give you an idea like how you can approach this. And there's, there's a really good, a solid structure in terms of how can you divide your product into different steps. Uh, so it should make your life easier, right? Okay. And then you need to implement uh, the tracking. And we'll, I think the next step for us will be naturally to talk about, 
you know, what, what tools do we need to, you know, for the job here? Yeah, <laughs> I think, uh, you know, if any of you watching have any more questions about how to pick the metrics, then go ahead and ask them and we'll you know, address them probably near the end of our session. But yes, we, one thing that we also promise is not just to talk about what metrics to choose, how to choose them, what frameworks to use, all that we covered just now, but also to actually be able to pick the tool that will help with all that we just discussed. So mapping the flows, finding out where users drop out, et cetera, et cetera. So let me just ask the big, big question here. How or rather, what tools do you think product managers, CEOs, founders need for analytics? Myself, Pavel, who wants to start? I, I can start. Google Analytics, of course. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the one that... I already spoiled you know, that Google Analytics is not enough, you know, in the, in the copy for this. So you can go ahead and skip that part. Yeah, Google Analytics uh, pops up uh, most often. Yeah. Like, it's a no-brainer because it's free and everybody uses Google Analytics. Uh, I mean, it's a great tool. I, I got to say that. I'm a marketer, I use it all the time. Um, but it's not the best tool for um, analyzing what's happening inside the product. And there are several reasons for that. One could be reporting and cohort analysis is fairly limited. And you know, segmenting your users and building so-called cohorts is where you can get the most insights. So comparing different groups of users, right? And their behavior, what they're doing, there are lots of uh, lots of insights there. So reporting so, will be one thing. Yeah, I was wondering if you could maybe very quickly define these cohorts because that's something that I learned like further down the line as a marketer, and I'm sure maybe some of the people watching don't exactly know what they should understand as cohorts. Yeah, so like it's it's a basic segmentation. You can segment by different criteria. Um, you can go with uh, behavioral criteria. So uh, a group of users that did something and a group of users that didn't, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, let's say a group of users that when they registered, they listened to a song uh, within seven days, right? And the mm -hmm. group that, that, that didn't do that. So these are two cohorts, right? Yeah, two cohorts. Okay. So th that's just an example. You could be like uh, build a cohorts iOS users if you have an app versus Android users, right? Mm. That would be a different cohort and how they interact. Yeah. Yeah, you can also have you can also have um, just like you know you, you made a, a huge change in your product like pricing or uh, like a like yeah this is the the one that I had like I, I like often did right so we we change pricing and uh, the prop, the value proposition for for trial users right and then uh, you change it so this is one called like like before the change and then after the change and week by week mm -hmm. right you can compare like the you know uh, just correlate some sort of uh, marketing activities and change the product with their behavior right so it help it helps you then just to say okay people that did, did, had like higher pricing and you know this was the offer they did less for instance or they did more of what I wanted right they came back they referred etc right so I think it's uh, from the product point of view I think it's, it's good to also bear in mind the changes the major changes in the product and comp being able to compare the segments of uh, your users your, your clients yeah okay. I think that's all clear oh yeah yeah and yeah usually like the insights that you can draw from from such comparison is usually for example one segment versus the other how we can retain them right and then you can pr pretty much draw a conclusion. Okay, this segment on that, and they we can retain them better. How we can make uh, other segments behave in the same way, right? Yeah. Okay. So, so you mentioned I, Google Analytics is limited in that way. Yeah, it's limited in terms of analyzing cohorts in general. It's the cohorts has have have been in uh, beta version for like for quite a while now in analytics. And you're limited in terms of um, a time, time span, like what time frame can you pick, and also what behaviors and actions you can mm -hmm. compare by, right? So the attributes that you can compare by. So, so, so just to simplify, I know it will be maybe just too simple for, for some of us, but just like Google Analytics is for web, right? What's going on there and just, 
all the other tools that we'll be talking about hopefully in a second is just are about like feature analysis right feature analytics so what's going on in the in in the product right right uh this would be like just to simplify things i know it's not like that but just like you know to keep it short somehow yeah okay. another thing about google analytics is that it uh it anonymizes the data so you technically you can do that there are workarounds to do that but it's not that handy so um you're pretty much you don't know what are the users right like who are the users you, you cannot kind of tie them to let's say an email address or any other personally identifiable information you cannot do that so you cannot zoom in right on a specific user and say hey this user gave us an nps of i don't know five or four let's let's take some action and reach out to him okay. you can do that with google analytics technically so so if not google analytics i'm going back to the question right so 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 what what should we use daniel right <laughs> like i know we have we have different we have different opinions like uh, i i just found like maybe i'll i'll start with like there a quote from like uh, like a co-founder of segment segment is just a tool that uh, aggregates different sources of data so for amplitude like customer mixed data platform yes, yes. <laughs> so, they call themselves. sure sure so um and, and they did have like a nice graph they, they do, do have a craft is showing that over the course of three years right they, the clients change pretty often the tools right the the average is eight tools uh, within three years right and this is <laughs> this is this is an overkill, I would say. But just ha happy to hear your comments. And also, we didn't we didn't answer the question. So, what are the, the examples, the tools that you would recommend, Daniel, or how would? Uh, well, it uh, will be like the the final tool at the end of the day will depend on your requirements, product requirements, right? The reports that you need, the how many people do you, do you, do you track in your product, right? So, what's your audience? Uh, what integrations do you need? You, you have to take into account all of these things. But um, so I won't tell you what tool exactly should you pick, but maybe I will give you a little bit an overview of mm -hmm. the market. And usually when it comes to like strictly product analytics tools, um, you have quite a, a few of them. There, there are many. Um, but the most... Popular ones are Mixpanel, Amplitude, Pando, and perhaps Heap. And it's good to compare those, um, at least those three, Mixpanel, Amplitude, and Heap, because that, that they pop up very often and they're mixed together in the same conversation, right? So, and they're also different in terms of how they price uh, so the billing is different, and that also will influence your decision. So tool like a tool like Mixpanel uh, will charge you by monthly tracked users, right? Um, Heap, on the contrary, will will charge you by sessions. So if you are like you have a lot of sessions, right? It's it's it will be pretty expensive, right? And Amplitude um, charges by events. Right, so actions taken in the app uh, oh, or so your product. Kind of gets, so it kind of gets more and more granular, right? With Mixpanel, yeah. it's just a single user who could have however many sessions. With, yes. I think you said Heap, it's like a session that can have however many events. And yes. then with, okay, and if I remember correctly, with Amplitude, it's like uh, there can be a lot of events within a single session by a single user. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, and that's and that's really important, you know. Uh, so, you will decide by looking at your product, and let's say you, you don't have that many users, right? But they do; they can do many, many events, right? Mm -hmm. So you will t think twice between going with amplitude because it could be expensive, right? Um, but on the other hand, you, you could have many, many users that, and product is not used that frequently. So you will think twice about Mixpound because, or Heap as well, because I have a lot of users, right? I will pay a lot of money. Um, so these are the things that, in terms of pricing, that you will look at. Like a little bit caveat to that is usually 
with some of the companies, you can try to approach the, uh, the accounts team and try to negotiate. Like, should I can can we change the the pricing model? Sometimes they do that. And one thing to mention as well, they there there are differences in terms of um, how they track users, how they how they are implemented the tools. With well, Mixpanel and Amplitude, they are being implemented in the kind of same way. They're very similar in this term. So you need to pre-select events, right? You need to hard code those uh, events uh, with with piece of JavaScript or whatever. You use SDK for yeah. that. Um, so it sounds like you're kind of locked in at that point. Yeah, and you, you you won't have the data from the past. If you say, I have like 10 metrics or 10 events that I want to track, right? And then suddenly you want to add another one. Uh, you won't get data retroactively, so you can't get oh. back. While Heap, for example, that's a, the, the most significant difference uh, with Heap is that the moment you implement the piece of JavaScript, the snippet on your website on Heap, you start. They start tracking everything, right? And then you just enter the the tool, and you can define events by yourself. Usually by looking at HTML or CSS classes and stuff like this. So Heap is really good for products that are at a very early stage, and they change a lot. Uh, and because you don't you don't require a developer necessarily to set up new events, right? You can do that yourself as a product manager or as a founder. Um, you can do, do that quickly, and you will get all historical data about that event. So that, that's a cool thing. And okay. all of those tools they have free plans that you need to check and and compare, right? All of those tools. Okay, so I was wondering, Pablo, well, you know, do you use the same kind of criteria when you're thinking about tools, or do you approach this differently? Uh, I'll just say, uh, I won't, I won't maybe get, get on the specific tool because I, I've used different. I mean, some of them, yeah, Mixpanel, of course, is on. It, it was on the list. I, I used other tools just for segmentation and mar marketing automation, and why? And I think is is, is a quite interesting because at that stage. Like this was the Polish, uh, I won't tell, I mean, it was user engaged, maybe, maybe you know, like I'm promoting them, that's good, right? Um, that at that stage they were starting and we get really special price, special offer. And mm -hmm. so I would, I would go what Daniel said that, uh, just maybe agree with that. Just if you want to buy a specific tool, just get to the site, download some materials, just so have the scoring because there is a user scoring, right? The, you know, depending on your action and then contacts, customer success, but not decide and come, come back and then the price will be different. So uh, it's obvious maybe for most of us, but I, I think it's good to say that never buy the, you know, based on the first offer. So this, this will be my tip. Uh, and, and just like I've learned from marketers, like from, from product marketers uh, that I had in my teams. Um, that will be in terms of the tooling. Um, one thing, uh, one thing, uh, if I could, yep. right, about the tooling. If you're a startup, uh, I think Heap as well, but Mixpanel and Amplitude for sure, they have a pretty good uh, startup plans. Um, so you should definitely go and check those mm -hmm. uh, because they will be set up for at least a year or two and you will be using the tool for free uh, with, um, with the startup plan. So it's definitely worth checking out. It's, it's always good to think about what what you want to do, what sort of experiments or changes you want to have in your product. Like whether you will go with A/B testing or like you need a, like you think you will need like a video session recording just to see the behavior itself. So then some of them, you know, there are some differences. I know Daniel, you have a, a pretty nice uh, framework just how to how to be, make the best possible decisions in terms of tools. Yeah. Uh, this yeah. is like as Daniel is like framework freak, so he's got a framework for the, this decision, right? And it's not necessarily a framework; it's a uh, Google spreadsheet. So. Um, yeah. But yeah, but the, the, it, it's pretty much the essence of, of of this is you let's say pick like three to five tools that you're interested in, 
you uh, write down all of the business you know requirements or business um, attributes that they have or criteria like pricing uh, what they do the best because usually they um, they will the messaging and the, how they communicate uh, about their product will tell you what they do the best right what part of product analytics reporting you know, correlation analysis and maybe this data science, more sophisticated stuff, You'll all of that will be in the messaging. So you write down all the business cases, right? Uh, pricing and stuff like this. And then uh, you need to ask yourself, okay, what requirements do I have for my business, right? So what reports do I need? Funnel reports, cohort reports, right? So maybe sophisticated visualization, dashboards, do I need to share dashboards with someone else, right? Like how many different levels of access to the tool do I need to safely use it, right? Because maybe I'm a product manager, I'll be like a super admin in the tool, but maybe I have someone in other department that I want to have the access to the data, but limited access, right? That will influence the pricing as well. So you need to okay. think about all this stuff. So what I'm hearing is you have a spreadsheet that helps to answer all of these questions. I have a spreadsheet that it's it, it gives you a structure. So it tells okay. you, okay, here you have five columns answered your five tools that you're thinking about, right? You have basic information like the business information about the tools. And then your job is to write down the questions or the requirements that you have, right? So this reporting, that reporting, that feature, this feature. And then you would say, all you need to do from, from that point onwards, you just pretty much check, okay, does this tool meet the requirement? Yes or no? And you check, right? Okay. Pretty much then it's automatically like in spreadsheets, conditional formatting. It either is when you, when you select, it meets the requirement, okay. it will turn, the cell will turn green. If not, the cell will, you know, will turn red and you will know, like visually you will know, okay, this is my tool. Okay, so before we talk about how to potentially access that spreadsheet, because Pablo is just playing Mr. Spoiler here <laughs> during this, you know, <laughs> he knows what we're going to say and he's like, oh, is, is there something you'd like to mention here? But anyway, uh, we do have a comment on LinkedIn that I wanted to address because this is something that I think is a relevant question. So Diamond is asking, how, co co how costly uh, is it to change the analytics tool? Is it worth to do it or should uh, a product manager, for example, just add a second tool while keeping the first one? So what would you say to that? Um, it, it depends. Like if, if the tool that you already have, right, is Google Analytics and that happens very often, uh, you should have both, right? Because marketing in in your company will use product analytics anyways and it's it, it doesn't cause any harm so if, if the tool is product it's not necessarily product analytics but more more overall analytics like google analytics keep it and try to think you know uh about the other tool that will be geared towards products um, if you have a different product analytics tool uh, and you want to replace that for some reason, um, whether it's costly or not, it depends how much money you are already put in the tool that you already have, right? Uh, so there's no, no right answer here. Uh, the implementation of the new tool is, it's, it's fairly the same process, right? Like you did, hopefully you did it right and you approach it right and you've got good data. But the, the only cost that I see here is if you had another tool, you had it implemented n not in the right way, your data wasn't good. So probably along the way, you kind of collected uh, some debt, so to speak. So you lost some money on the way, right? And mm -hmm. whether you should choose a new tool or not, that depends on your requirements, right? But if your current tool doesn't meet the requirements and you want to change and you have wrong data, that's 100% worth it, right? Mm -hmm. To finally get the right information, and right data points and to make uh, good decisions. So I know it's a little bit bland, but it's, um, it's tough to answer without more context, right? I suppose one thing I would add here, if I may, Pablo, 
<laughs> is that well, a lot of these tools, uh, very often during the sales process, they try to lock you into yearly billing. So if we have that, then obviously you need to take that into right. account yeah, when the next bill is coming and try to kind of get the timing right if you're on yearly billing. And another thing is, you know, when we look at our website, for example, from time to time, uh, well, these analytics tools leave behind code that runs when people visit the site. This code can end up slowing down the responsiveness of your website. So, you know, when you do make the switch, make sure that you do some cleaning up, cleaning up after that, that you don't have code that runs for no reason because it's from a tool that you are no longer using because then you're, when your page speed goes down, your user experience gets worse, you could rank worse in Google if you care about that for your particular website or domain. So that's something, you know, it's, it's an extra step to take and it's a cost if you don't pay attention to that. Kuba, may I now? Yes, you may. I will just add on the top of that, like share my story. And I think it, it's it's related with Damien's question. So I will just like, you know, thinking about cost, especially when you're a CEO or like you know, somewhere like, like mid manager, right? It is important to think about the cost, not only about, you know, the, the money, like, you know, that you pay, but just the time that it's really precious, especially yeah. when you have limited limited people right on board. So I remember um, spending like two days on the chat with support, like trying to figure out the events that why they didn't work and why it's, you know, I'm going back to the first scenario that Daniel mentions, right? So I have the data, but it just it doesn't match, right? So the segment that I've selected, I want to have a campaign, right? Like people that, you know, downloaded those reports, et cetera, and perform certain actions. They actually, you know, I see that, you know, that they, they've got they've got wrong attributes, right? And they cannot be that people. And then it's a puzzle and you can spend like weeks trying to figure out what the hell is wrong. And this is really precious. I mean, this is really pricey. So if you think about like changing the tool and having the, cor you know, the correct data, it's not only about, you know, the pricing, but it's just, you know, have the total understanding of the cost, right? It's just as, as we have people from 37 Signals, right? The, the famous book Rework, right? So uh, how much the, the meeting uh, is, uh, what's the price of the meeting, right? Just you, you, you have to uh, multiply all, you know, the payrolls of the people in, right? And and just but the time that they spend, right? And here is the same. So usually on this, you know, level C, like right, we we don't see everything, right? So this is the the danger, right? You don't see that, you know, the product manager will spend just three days thinking, okay, well, what's what's wrong, right? Like, and, and just it will slow you down. So. I would say um, it may be, and in my in my cases, it was really cost uh, costly to change tools. And um, we didn't go into maintenance and you know just being able how, how you know the implementation challenges maybe for is pro most probably for another time, right? But it just yeah. the main the main risk is just not to get those events right and not to have the documentation updated. And then at the end of the day, it's just you have something, you have the data, but you cannot do anything about with that, right? You, you cannot promote or you cannot just uh, create some sort of change in your product because it's not reliable. This is the, the issue, right? So um, it's for, you know, more advanced clients, right? But, but still, um, it's just something that, you know, if you want to change, just calculate everything, right? To check how uh, they're responding to your requests, right? Uh, also check whether you have some a skilled individual on, on the site, right? In your team that understands the documentation and can, 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 can you know, can um, help you out with all the challenges. And ho hopefully it won't be the product manager, right? He, he's, <laughs> most of the time he's too busy doing other things. I, I would add one thing that the highest cost that you will pay perhaps is the data that you will lose from the previous tool. Mm. Um, so you, you need to really figure this out. Do you really, can you afford losing all the data that you had? It's a little bit, you know, it's tough to answer because it depends whether the data that you have right now, it's, it's a good data or not necessarily. Mm. Was the tracking good or it, it was bad? So start with, once again, start with strategy, analyze, check the whether you're tracking the right things, see if you track those things in, in the tool that you already have. And if yes, just tweak the tracking. If not, 
figure out uh, what's the best tool for the job and change it, it it's, it's worth it. But if it's Google Analytics, it's not really a change. It's just an, you're adding another tool to your belt of tools okay. with analytics. It's worth it, yeah. I think that summarizes it pretty well. And I hope, Damian, that answers your question. If you have any additional questions, you can always reach out to us directly. And now, it's been almost an hour of us <laughs> having this uh, deep dive into Prague analytics. So I think, even though you know, I feel like we're you know just getting kind of going here, it would be good to you know to be uh, well to also to take a look at uh, our time and places to be. <laughs> uh, so let's start wrapping up then. First, the first thing I wanted to resolve, though, is this whole matter of Daniel's uh, spreadsheet. We are planning to make it, I'm going to, I'm going to spoil it now. <laughs> We're planning to make it available to you, uh, dear watchers, and I, I, you can look forward to getting that in the coming days. And the best way to make sure that you can get this spreadsheet that will help you to pick the right tool for your analytics is to follow us. Follow us, DXNX on LinkedIn, for example. And better yet, subscribe to our newsletter. You can do that on the site, on our blog, and that will help ensure that you'll get the message when this becomes available and it will be very, very soon. So that's one thing that I wanted to mention that I hope you watchers uh, can you know, pay attention to and because it's, uh, it's a really useful tool. And Hopefully now- Hopefully we'll add it next week. I, I'm hoping for next week, I need to make this spreadsheet more beautiful for you. you know? Yeah. So, yeah. So it looks- Fresh. Too ugly like to show. We couldn't fresh. possibly. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, so that's one thing to keep in mind, uh, guys. Any closing remarks or anything else you know that I, I didn't ask about and you wanted to talk about before we wrap this up? Yeah, I would have one thing to the cost. <laughs> okay. Let's start with that. Damien asked about the costs in general, the cost of tools, and one thing that I f forgot to mention is that. It's it's not it's not necessarily that you will start paying for the tool right away. Um, companies have pretty robust free plans or free free tiers. Like an amplitude is up to ten million events a month, so that's a lot of events. So most of the time, and especially if you're a startup, you can start uh, for free or with the startup plan, right? So that that's one thing that I wanted to add on on mm. the pricing side. Cool. Uh, I would add something from, um, let's say, the helicopter view, uh, and and this is like the lessons that I've learned. The more I work with CEOs, is that it's the tooling, the pricing, is or the implementation, maintenance. It's all important, but it's not the game. I mean, it's not the, the most important. If you have a self-sustainable business and you're growing, you have some financing. The uh, I think that the, the, there is a shift that is needed. That it's not a. It's like with agile and adopting agile agility, right? It's we at the very beginning we think it's about the practices like daily or Scrum reviews or having these prints uh, right, etc. But there is a there there are principles beneath, right? And it's all about people and just having the mindset, the right mindset. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really pretty important for the CEO to remember that that it's not about the tooling; it's about the shift, uh, changing the mindset from feature factory to more data-driven uh, organization, right? And this is what you have to embrace. So tooling won't work if you won't support the change in your organization, right? You have to have leader or leaders, right, who understand that, who, who's got, who like, they, they just actually, they've got data in their blood, right? And they, they're open to share their experiences. Do, so it's not only, even if you have data warehouse, right, or, you know, this is, I'm going back to examples that I, I you know, with, with CEOs or companies I, I worked with, so it's not about like having all the infrastructure if there are not no no people or or the product culture that supports data driven development it won't work so or it will be like really basic level so this is you know the note from me at the end hopefully um it can just inspire you somehow just to think about about it more broadly yeah certainly what this is inspiring me to think about is a follow-up session for this, right? Because there's a lot of steps in this process that we didn't cover. We could have a whole session about this uh, mindset of actually you know, focusing on product analytics and then implementing the tools, who should do it, how it should be done. This is stuff that we had planned for today initially, but when we started just preparing the content, we knew that 
probably wouldn't make the cut. And it didn't. We have to leave that for next time. All right, then. We so can give a sneak peek or a piece of advice to people that already have analytics, right? And um, they don't necessarily are interested in implementing, but um, they are wondering, they're in the third case, right? So I have analytics, but I don't trust the data. So usually what I uh, came across is that uh, there's no one that maintain the uh, the data, right? Hmm. It's it's a huge topic, but a piece of advice: have someone that examine the, you know, the infrastructure, the setup of analytics, and see hmm. if it's tracked. Everything is tracked correctly, right? Every single month, for example, every single quarter, just to make sure you have the right data. So if you have analytics, just do that. You know, okay. we'll sleep better. Okay. So thank you for teasing what we could possibly cover next time you you guys are making it really difficult to say goodbye you know um, but i think this would be the point at which uh, we're going to have to do that so dear watchers thank you for lis listening to us thank you for uh, visiting us here at the sdx next live show and giving us a part of your thursday i want to say uh, yeah it is thursday thank you for watching and well i guess we'll see you next time and you can follow us you know LinkedIn, wherever you're watching to get updated on what the next session is going to be about and when it's going to be. All right. Say goodbye, guys. This is the end. It's time to say. <laughs> Thank you. And fingers crossed for your data driven approach. All the best. Yeah. Yeah. Take care. Bye bye. All the best. Take care. Bye bye.